Hello, everybody, and welcome to Evolution of Media in an Ever-Changing World. Um, as folks are joining, I will do some housekeeping remarks. Um, so we do ask that everyone stay muted unless you're asked to speak. That way we can be sure to hear our speakers clearly. So please double check that you are muted as we begin. Uh, you can find that micro, uh, microphone icon at the bottom of your screen. We love to see everyone's faces and have kept the Zoom program in a meeting format so we can all see each other. But of course, if you prefer to have your video off, you can turn that setting off at the bottom of your screen as well. Um, speaking of faces, you have the option to change between speaker view uh, to focus only on active speakers and the full meeting view. So you should see that option in the upper right corner of your screen. Um, and if you would like to change your name display to include your class year, please do so. You can do that by hovering over your image and you should see three dots in the upper right corner of your video feed. Our chat is open, so please do use that to say hello to one another, to ask a question of the panelists um, as we enter the Q&A section later. And depending on the size of the group this evening, we may actually be able to use the hand raising function and you can find that under reactions at the bottom of your screen. You can also select other reactions um, if you'd like to respond with applause or celebration or a variety of emotions uh, to our panel discussion. We have captions for anyone who needs or would like them, and those can be turned on and off by clicking on the bottom at the button, the button at the bottom that says live transcript. Um, and then we are also recording the session so that alumni who are unable to attend can watch it at a later time. Um, so with that, I will uh, get it kicked off tonight panel again is the evolution of media in an ever-changing world. Uh, the pandemic and the 2020 elections made clear how important it is for the public to have access to solid factual information, but the media industry faces big challenges from the spread of disinformation to the rise of social media platforms. How do we maintain our sense of mission in a time of dramatic change? Uh, we have an amazing group of alumni here with us this evening. You can see their full and extraordinarily impressive bios on the event page. Um, and I'll include a few highlights here, along with some fun Bates facts. Uh, so our moderator, of course, is Carolyn Ryan, class of 1986. She is the deputy managing editor at the New York Times. As a masthead leader, she is deeply involved in managing the newsroom staff, handling everything from recruiting journalists to improving diversity and reshaping lines of coverage. Carolyn came to the Times in 2007 to serve as the New York political editor. In 2011, she was promoted to Metro editor. She became Washington bureau chief in 2013 and ran the presidential campaign coverage in 2016. Prior to joining the Times, Carolyn was deputy managing editor at the Boston Globe. On Bobcat News, Carolyn played tennis and wrote the restaurant and theater reviews and feature stories for the Bates student. Senior year, along with two other students, she brought, bought a $450 car called the Comet, which had no muffler and made a loud entry every time it rumbled onto campus. <laughs> In our panel, we have Niraj Chukshi, business reporter at the New York Times. Niraj covers transportation and its impact on the world from the airline industry's fight for survival to the startup shaping the future of autonomous vehicles to the ships and ports that have kept goods moving through the pandemic. He previously reported on a wide range of subjects as a general assignment reporter at the Times and the Washington Post. Niraj was a psychology major at Bates and a recovering Papa John's pizza addict. He was also an editor of the Bates Student and lived in what is now a yoga workout room in the drab basement of Smith Hall. <laughs> Our next panelist is uh, Juan Costa, class of 1996, digital news editor at CNN. He started his career in digital news media at the Wall Street Journal in 1999 and has worked at the New York Times, Yahoo News, MSN News, Facebook Media, and Newsday. At Bates, Juan was an international student, lived in the basement of Adams freshman year, and majored in political science, going on to receive his MA in political theory from the University of Essex, UK. Next, we have Josh Macht, class of 1991, Chief Product Innovation Officer at Harvard Business Publishing, HBP. Uh, HBP is a global media and learning company that produces the Harvard Business Review. Beginning on July 1st, Josh has been named Acting Chief Executive Officer. Prior to this role, Josh had been the group publisher of the Harvard Business Review. He joined HBP in 2006 from Time, where he worked as the editor-in-chief of Time.com. He was also the magazine's technology editor. Before that, he co-founded Inc.com and served as an editor and writer for Inc. Magazine. He's written for several publications, including Time Magazine, The Atlantic, Fast Company, and The Boston Globe. 
Brian McGrory is class of 1984 and the editor of the Boston Globe. Brian's first newspaper job was as a reporter with the Patriot Ledger in Quincy, Mass. In 1985, he moved to the New Haven Register as a reporter and later became the newspaper's first Washington correspondent. Brian came to the Globe in 1989 as a suburban reporter covering the South Shore. He worked as the Globe's roving national reporter in 1995 and 1996 before moving to the Washington Bureau as White House correspondent. McGrory moved back to Boston as a Metro columnist in 1998. He added the title of associate editor to his portfolio in 2004, and in 2007, he left column writing to become the paper's Metro editor. He was named editor of the paper in December 2012. He won the Scripps Howard Award for Commentary and the Sigma Delta Chi Award for General Column Writing in 2011. Brian has also written five books. So welcome to our panelists. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, this is so exciting. So next I will hand the virtual mic off to Carolyn to kick off the panel questions. And in about half an hour, we'll move to the Q&A. So about, over to you, Carolyn. Great. Um, thank you, Megan. And thanks for everyone who is out there. It's fun to see uh, so many faces. Um, I just want to dive right in, and I think I'll start uh, with a question for McGrory, Brian McGrory. Um, Brian, I do have to mention, um, I live in New York now, but have been a faithful subscriber and the, did the... Uh, anyway, the paper has been spectacular over the past decade, and some, some people just compliment the sports, but I have to say the full array of coverage uh, is amazing. So uh, congratulations on that. I wanna dive in and ask you a question. You're a former White House correspondent, uh, obviously running one of the most important regional papers in the country. Um, we're coming off this extraordinary period of Donald Trump and the end, you know, pray, uh, praying the end of the pandemic. And I really wanted to ask you, what impact do you think Donald Trump has left on the media, how we cover presidents and just on news cycles and news coverage. Uh, thank you, Carol. And uh, first of all, thanks for the invitation to, uh, to be here tonight. I'm really honored. I'm really honored to be here with such an esteemed group of journalists. Um, so thank you for that. And um, uh, Carolyn, what the New York Times has been doing um, you know, under your leadership as well has been extraordinary uh, these last many years. You've had an amazing run there uh, in the Times has uh, led the way in figuring out a business model for successful media in America, which we all appreciate. Um, uh, in terms of the question about the impact of uh, Trump uh, on the media, it's mixed, right? Uh, I mean, I'd be curious to get your take, Carolyn, but my quick take is that um, the media has felt under threat uh, like no other time in modern history. Uh, everything from uh, legal threat to you know what we've been seeing very lately with reporters having their phone records and email records uh, pursued by the government, people being threatened with jail, uh, people in media organizations, including the, the New York Times and CNN uh, put under gag order uh, as these things have happened. Um, Trump was pushing the whole notion of the news media being the enemy of the people. Um, his uh, reporters have been under physical threat when they attend Trump events and the like. Um, it's been extraordinary in that regard. And yet we come uh, to the end of the Trump administration and beyond. And it feels to me, and I'd be curious what everybody uh, on the panel thinks of this, it feels like the media's um, strengthened in many ways by Trump's run, um, that we um, became more relevant to the public in uh, really vital ways over the last four or five years. Um, we're seeing that in our subscription numbers. Uh, the Globe hasn't had this many subscribers in probably 15 years. Um, the New York Times has never had this many subscribers ever. Uh, CNN has never had the ratings that it has, has had. Uh, people have really turned to the news media to get truth and to get facts in an age when uh, it's a lot more popular to make enemies than it is to make friends. And I think we've been, um, I think we've acquitted ourselves very, very well and we've been more relevant than ever before. But that that's my take, maybe it's Pollyannish, but uh, I'd be curious what you guys think. Josh, I was wondering if you, um, partly because you understand not only the journalistic mission, but the business mission and the product side, do you share that kind of optimism? Um, 
Yeah, I think I do. I mean, I'm, I guess there's a part of me that I think for mass media, there's a part of that has to you know be concerned about what happens next. You know, we've just come through huge, big, big issues and pivoting from one to the next and dealing with pandemic, racial strife, the, the Trump backdrop. So, um, you know, you thinking, having been just someone online for such a long time, you sort of think about how can you sustain those levels? But what Brian says makes a ton of sense to me. I mean, even if you think about a brand like HBR, which is a niche, right, for executives, we've really stretched because of Trump, right? We, we moved, and in some ways, because of our coverage, in many ways, moved to business and society, because there were so many business leaders that were stepping up. And, you know, one of the big stories, and we did an interview with Ken Frazier's, the African-American CEO of Merck, or was, he, after uh, Trump said uh, disparaging things um, to African-Americans after Charlottesville, he stepped down from Trump's business council. It was a huge, huge story. Ends up, But it turns into a, a, a big interview with the editor-in-chief of HBR that really drove a lot of interest. You know, what was it that this business leader felt was so important that was way beyond any, you know, uh, deleterious effects to potentially to the to Merck or anything like that. He had to do what was right. And all of a sudden, this issue of business leaders stepping up, maybe saying things against Trump, and there's a ton of risk there. We saw that with a lot of business leaders. All of a sudden, we're, you know, we were stretching our brand as well. And I think I think that we are that there is a real you know to Brian's point I think the heart of media for what you for what you do for sure it strengthens strengthen things but us too you know I think it had this effect of um, for a lot of different um, media properties. Niraj, I'm wondering if you could jump in here um, before your current job you were working on what was essentially our breaking news desk and a desk that was especially tethered to readers' interests, and I think a desk that was pretty sensitive to polarization uh, in our audience. Do you feel like there's been a shift in terms of readers' interests post-election uh, since Biden was elected? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think that, I think it's been going on. I think, I think it was sort of changing throughout the Trump, the Trump era. Um, and I, I think that there is, I think that you know both Trump and Biden are sort of forcing us to reckon with this sort of decades-long erosion of trust, not only in journalism, um, but also in all of you know in all of these institutions across the board. And and I think that um, you know as as dangerous as Trump's rhetoric could be, and and as difficult as it was, I think he also forced journalists to sort of reckon with the fact that people don't or readers don't trust us in the same way, and they expect us to kind of show our work uh, more uh, than, you know, maybe a lot of us were used to. So um, I think, you know, in, in that way, it was sort of uh, humbling in, in a healthy way. I mean, do you think, Juan, I was wondering, how do we rebuild that sense of trust? I mean, when you look at the numbers, uh, like the Pew survey, people don't believe us, they don't believe CNN, they don't believe uh, the New York Times, or they see us through a very ideological filter. Mm -hmm. Are there are there real things that we can do to change that? Uh, I think there are. I mean, I think um, local local news, for example, you know, they have they play a, a very important role in this. Uh, they're closer to the communities, you know, that they report on, and they they're often better able to localize uh, large national issues, you know. Uh, for their uh, local uh, audiences. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, local papers, you know, they, they do play a, a very important role in that, in building, in building trust, um, you know, but, but we, uh, I think we need to continue telling the stories that matter, um, stories that uh, reflect the issues that are important uh, to communities. Um, you know, stories that have impact, uh, uh, that, you know, bring accountability and change. Um, and sometimes we need to just say things, you know, plainly, um, you know, when we talk about, about you know, democracy in, uh, in the abstract, you know, what do we mean by that? Uh, and, um, 
and I think you know, we, you know we, we definitely need to be transparent uh, uh, on what we do. But I think ultimately, you know, critical thinking and you know news literacy, you know, it can be the sole responsibility of one, you know, of the media industry, right? Um, it has to be a responsibility that is shared, you know, by by communities, uh, uh, schools. Uh, leaders of all kinds, you know, influencers. Uh, so I don't think it's, you know, it's solely up to us, you know, to rebuild trust. Right, right. Uh, Brian, I'm wondering, I mean, you've been connected to Boston, like very few journalists. Do you see a difference or a diminishment uh, in how the globe is viewed or skepticism versus when you were a reporter? Um, you know, covering neighborhoods, covering city hall, et cetera? Oh, to your point, I sort of came with the furniture here. I've been here forever. And uh, um, uh, it's a nice way of saying you're really old, Brian, and you've been around forever. But uh, um, um, look, we, you know, years ago, and, and you know this, Carolyn and I grew up in the same town uh, in Weymouth uh, on the South Shore. And Back then, uh, newspapers, the Boston Globe, the Patriot Ledger, were almost like the local utility. Everybody got it. It was, uh, you know, it was basically a buck or a buck and a quarter a week. I had a paper route in Weymouth, and 75, 80 percent of the uh, houses on any given street I was on got the Globe, and you would deliver it, and you just go from house to house. There wasn't any real competition. I mean, you could have a newspaper, radio, or television. That was basically it. And now in the age of the uh, internet um, and cable television and a whole lot of other things going on, streaming and everything else, um, the competition for people's time is intense. We're not just competing with other media companies. We're competing with all sorts of other things. People don't feel the responsibility to keep up with local news or any kind of news like they used to. So in that way, we are going to feel naturally diminished. We simply don't have the same level of readership we might have had back then and the same level of kind of civic obligation that if you're going to be involved, you need to read the Globe or some other paper. But um, I, what we need to be to win an audience is to be relentlessly interesting. I use that phrase so much in the Globe newsroom, people just roll their eyes at it at this point, but it's uh, you need to be interesting every single day online and in print, or you're not going to bring readers in. You also need to be reliable. You need to break news. You need to be in the moment. You need to do sharp investigations. And, you know, very lately, and again, this might be me being Pollyannish again, it just feels like the Globe and other, there are some other big regional papers around the country that I, I see the same thing, especially in Minneapolis um, uh, and a couple of other places where we feel in a very fractured environment, we feel ever more relevant to the communities. I mean, we've been breaking stories in Boston about the police department that have caused um, a justifiable havoc up here and you know, wholesale change. Um, uh, and I can see that happening in other big cities across the country too. So I think we may not have the same level of readership, but in a very tumultuous uh, media environment, we almost have more gravitas. And I think that matters every bit as much. Yeah, I mean, but I, I, well, sorry, I bet I mean, you know, I'm having live around here and reading the globe and seeing what you guys have done recently. But I think it's true for for all of us. There's, you know, there was the mass media model, which is like, we just have to get as many people as possible. And if whether you're the globe or whatever, you just have to, and there's still a lot of pressure to do that. But I think going forward, you're you're looking at how do you deeply engage people? Like, how is it that the stories about the police department are are sent around everywhere? Why are people talking about them? You know, the more time people spend with you, this is a big thing for me. I, I like your relentlessly interesting. You know, I, I always feel like we need, even an, a brand like ours, there's no daily reason to come to hbr.org, but you don't exist if somebody doesn't come. I mean, if someone doesn't come. So you need to be something that people crave and people really want to deeply like engage with. And that's where I can kind of, you can kind of see where the brands here on this panel are, are headed. Well, Carolyn, I'd like to actually get your take on it because I think the Times has in many ways been the pioneer of being relentlessly interesting. I mean, you put together a website or an app every day that keeps people engaged uh, like deeply. You wanna read all the way down that app to see what else you have. You are 
you know, it, it's interesting to see the models that you and the Washington Post have employed. I think the Times has been so effective in branching out um, far beyond even excellent investigative work, but to data reporting, to visual reporting, to cooking, to all sorts of uh, things that you might not normally associate with the state old New York Times, but you've done it all so well, and it's really resulted in a huge boom at your place. Yeah, uh, but, but it, it took many years to get there. Yes, say more about that, John, because you were at the Times at one point, right? Yeah, I, I joined the Times in 2001 when uh, the, the digital side was still a separate company uh, from the paper. I mean, uh, we were actually in a different building. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a very different place. And, you know, we kind of uh, pioneered, you know, digital storytelling because um you know we had this new medium and we wanted to stay, to use it to tell stories in a very digital way you know we didn't want to mimic what the paper was doing uh yeah. so you know early on you know we did a lot of um audio slideshows you know uh, interactive graphics you know that were you know they were uh, sort of they were, they were new, you know, there, it was a new way of, of storytelling. Uh, and, you know, but the times, you know, for a long time, you know, still was, you know, very, you know, uh, traditional in, 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 in presentation and in the things that they covered. Um, so it took many years and, you know, to try to convince, you know, the leadership to, you know, embrace uh, digital and, um, you know, and that eventually happened, um, you know, uh, by I think, I think by maybe by 2005, 2006, you know, we all got, uh, you know, into the same, same building in 2007, we got into the same building and, um, okay. I think, I think you're describing something that for people who don't work in newsrooms is really interesting. You came to the Times and you were putting out a digital report uh, on the internet. And it sounds like at the same time, the leadership of the paper, for them, it was still a print paper. Like that's what they yeah. focused on. That's what they cared about. Those six stories on front on the front page. It just okay. sounds like- Yeah, it, it was still like that. We know the, the digital was sort of an afterthought you know, yeah. you were you were writing for the paper. You were you were not writing for for digital. And at one point, you know, they they uh, they realized, you know, that you know we couldn't wait. It, you know, the web couldn't wait until the end of the day. You know, to 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 update. You know, which stories. So they put together the the CND uh, desk, the continuous news desk. I don't know if it still exists. Uh, yeah. Which was a desk that specifically wrote for for the website, you know, so, so that we could have fresh material throughout the day. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just, it feels like a three generations around. The yeah. mistakes that we all made are staggering and we all basically made the same mistakes. The idea that we're still alive and here uh, is, a, is a miracle. I mean, starting with the big mistake of you know, the industry collectively thought that it would be a fantastic idea uh, 10 or 15 or 20 years ago to give all our expensive journalism away for free. And then we acted shocked that people migrated away from the paid print product and took us online for free. It was like opening a Macy's next to a Macy's. And in the new Macy's, you just gave everything away and bragged about all the traffic coming through the door. And it took a while and it was, uh, uh, it was you know, quite bluntly, the courage of the New York Times had said, no, we're putting a paywall up. Uh, um, the Wall Street Journal was there before you, but they're a bit of a niche product. And that set the industry on fire with the idea that people will actually pay. Sorry, the dog is barking. Um, I, I will, go ahead. Just if I can chime in real quick, I, I will say that um, even in the time that I've been at the Times, it, it's, it so, stands so starkly uh, in contrast to to what you described uh, in, in a great way. I, you know, I mean, just today I was in a meeting with a few editors and we were talking about um, some coverage areas and 
you know, we, we were talking mainly about a story, but at the end we, had, we decided, you know, we had kind of identified a few different topics to cover. It was about cruises and, and the return of cruises. And one of them seemed really well suited to, to images. And, and that was clear immediately. And, and, and that was exactly where we turned. We said, oh, that, that sounds like a great visual story. And there was no, it wasn't, you know, someone whose job it is to kind of prod and do that. It was just natural, a piece of the conversation. That, oh yeah, you know, we'll write this story, but we should also do a photo essay. And, you know, in, in, in a way it's traditional, but, you know, in, in a lot of ways it's not. Um, and, I, and I thought it was just sort of, it was nice to kind of see how fluid it was. And that's how you should be. Yeah. Yes. Naraj, can you describe your beat a little bit to the people who are here, just uh, the the contours of it and, and where you think we'll start to see activity? Yeah. Um, so I, I cover the business of transportation. Um, so it's, you know, airlines, uh, EVs, Tesla sometimes. Um, but, you know, but the, the brunt of the coverage for the past year has been airlines uh, and, and cruise ships sometimes and, and, you know, how difficult it's been for the for this industry. Um, the summer's looking pretty good for airlines. Um, I think um, it's going to be a long recovery for them. Um, it's really unclear. Bus business trip, business travelers are a really big piece of their business, and it's really unclear when or to what degree they're going to return. Um, I think there's some hope that you know you you will have to have in-person meetings uh, to retain clients and to attract clients. But you know, a lot of the the trips that you know people would would go on to for a three hour meeting in you know, a city not too far away might disappear. Um, right. But yeah, I mean, it, it's looking good, uh, but I think you know, even, even for cruises, I mean, I think for the entire industry, things are looking good, everyone's happy, but you know, the time it's gonna take to return to sort of 2019 levels might, might be a while. Right, right. I mean, we've been talking about this in part because we want, a, a lot of our readers wanna bring back our travel section, which we essentially uh, mothballed during the pandemic. And I think part of it is because they want to travel, but part of it is they just want to picture themselves there and like think about, like fantasize about, you know, traveling even if they're not doing it yet. Um, um, before we move on, just because I'm going to steal this phrase, um, I just want to ask Brian, relentlessly interesting, give me three stories that have appeared in the Boston Globe this year that you would put in that category. Talk about putting me on the spot, Carolyn. Um, <laughs> and the worst part is, oh my God, the editor of the Globe can't think of three relentlessly interesting stories in the Globe that year. <laughs> uh, come back to me in a little bit. And give me a little bit of thought I here. Definitely do that. And Naraj, I want to ask you, since you uh, were working on what we called our express desk, you don't have to tell us the exact story, but um, and, or the exact audience, but what? What was the article that you did that went the most viral? Oh, that's a good question. Um, uh, there were, I mean, there were a few. Politics was always reliably, um, reliably viral. I think there was, I'm, I'm going to get, I can't remember the details of this, but there was, it was, I, I think, I think it was before he was officially president, um, but candidate Trump, I, I think he was a candidate still. Um, he had said something about uh, the Revolutionary War, and he had suggested that there were maybe airplanes <laughs> lying around. And um, and my editor pushed me to write something that that had a little bit more voice to it. That that was, you know, still a news story, but it was sort of um, kind of tongue in cheek and, and wasn't, I don't think, too necessarily harsh on candidate Trump, but just sort of joking about it. And it did really well, and I was really happy with how it turned out. I thought we walked this extremely fine line in political news coverage, um, and so you know, it was sort of it, it was sort of both viral and something that I could stand behind. <laughs> That's fantastic, um, John. I want to turn to you a little bit um, and ask you about the Biden presidency. Um, what's your sense of where the big storylines are there? What what? Where is the drama? You know, we've seen some readers um, describe the new president as dull or seem less interested in the kind of daily coverage of the president. Uh, what do you think will be the big emerging storylines? I think, you know, he has a big agenda and he has a lot of fights ahead of him. Uh, there's still a lot of drama to be had. I mean, um, you know, Washington, uh, unfortunately, you know, it's still the same old, you know, gridlock and uh, obstruction. So 
I think, you know, the drama of those fights, you know, uh, will make it uh, more interesting, you know, to, to cover. Josh, what do you think? What do you want to read about when it comes to Biden? Well, I'm, I'm really curious from you guys around how Biden positions his vice president. Should he be a one term person? So do you um, I mean, the two things that I'm most interested in is do you put resources against covering a former president like Trump who drives a lot of eyeballs? Um, and do you put more resources than normal against a vice president who may be a presidential candidate because is a one one term guy? Um, and then on the other side of it, I'm very curious, how is Biden's administration so cognizant of needing to position her? What are they doing to spin the, that? Uh, how are they doing that? that right. That's what intrigues me the most. I mean, I, I guess to your first point, it feels like that it's an imperative to cover Trump and you have to be restrained and not uh, just do it for audience. But for us, obviously, in New York, given the seriousness of the investigations into his company, into him, uh, into his family. Uh, we, we really have to stay, those are really competitive stories for us. And those are stories that will have a big impact on his future. And then I'm sure you've seen this, but just our national political correspondents, when they go out to these states, Trump is still kind of eclipsing some of these stories and shaping the stories and shaping the success or failure of some of these candidates. So it's a really unusual, and I think kind of unprecedented post-presidency. Um, I guess he wouldn't call it a post-presidency, but um, uh, there, it's going to demand a lot from us, both in terms of being measured when we have to be measured, but making sure we're understanding how he's still exercising power within the Republican party. I mean, I find it just extraordinary uh, watching the yeah. Senate. Yeah, that story, Josh Hawley and the people who are trying to, the senators trying to take into that vacuum that it got nowhere because Trump didn't really leave is a fascinating story. I mean, it's a fascinating, I, 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 I think, you know, and, and reading about that in the times, I, I find it to be invaluable. I mean, to me, one of the most interesting figures uh, and complicated figures is Romney because you sort of occasionally see him uh distance himself in a very emphatic way in a very kind of uh, forceful way from trump and then other times he seems i don't know what it is if he's cowed or if he feels like there are certain fights he doesn't want to pick or take on but i just find him such a fascinating person i guess especially because his seat seems so safe uh nowadays um yeah. Anyway, about those um, relentlessly interesting stories. <laughs> Anything to do with our new mayor? Anything to do with our new mayor, Brian? They are not, they are not going to sound as relentlessly interesting when I describe them, but uh, um, I will talk to you offline about it. But, it, you know, we did one um, that I really liked that got extraordinary readership. Um, during the pandemic in the winter, we took one block of one downtown street and we showed the radiating impact around the world of that street basically being shut down, that it wasn't just the um, small Italian restaurant there. It was a tomato grower in Florida who was suffering badly. It was the supplier of paper products from the Midwest uh, and on again, on and on with every uh, shop on the street. And it showed the connection of the world uh, to one small side street that you wouldn't even notice in downtown Boston. It's that kind of thing that, uh, you know, I think that we need to do more of. Uh, we are doing quite a bit, but we always need to do more of to capture and uh, hold on to a readership. You know, so um, can I answer your question as well? Of course. I'm eager to hear what you're going to say. Well, because because again, this is what I think these this this moment has done. Where so the 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 big thing that we did early in the pandemic and it happened with an editor who just happened to be talking to a grief grief expert, David Kessler, and because of our editor in chief and the way we're structured, the interview seemed really interesting. But it wasn't something typical for HBR, and it ended up being a story called "That Discomfort You're Feeling Is Grief." And it was really early on and millions of millions of people. I mean, 
you know, page views wise, an HBR story can do 25,000 pages. That's good. A million is amazing, but millions and millions and millions of people around the globe. Wow. And I think it really, again, it showed that, you know, even within these niches, and I think some, you know, the, the, the times is really doing well, as Brian said, with some of these niches that are really important because they've got such deep enthusiasts, whether it's cooking or whatever, but inside of those, you actually can stretch. It's really an interesting thing in ways that we, you know, now those millions of people probably are, they all going to become hardcore HBR readers, maybe not, but they see us in a very different light as a result of world events that we were like, well, maybe we should play a role. And that's what the internet has done. Like, it's like, you can't sit on the sidelines. Even if it used to be an HBR, you know, we joke, it was like the depression, they thought they were covering it quickly because the great depression was covered like 30 years later in HBR because it was like, well, now we have all the research. And, uh, you know, and that was considered fast. Now we have to play a role and, and it's actually a really important thing. And in spite of all the, there's certainly a ton of negative things that come with, you know, certainly as I've watched the, the internet grow, but there is this thing that is really important. It allows us to stretch brands. And I, and I think in many, you know, around this table, we've done that in different ways. You do it really well, Josh. And the, the word I also keep coming back to, which you guys do really, really well, is provocative. Um, it, it's not any good to just be passive and report what other people say. You need to provoke thought. And that's what HBR does uh, really, really well. Um, so I, I, I admire that. It's funny. It's, it's um, Carolyn, you might have the same experience at the times. Very well-intended people in the front office will always say, well, what really brings in readership? Uh, do more of that. And where I push back on that is it, it's when you're a, 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 a relatively mainstream news organization like ours, it's not one thing that brings in subscribers and then keeps them. It's actually everything. And it's the, the, you know, the whole notion of serendipity that you're going to come to our site or come to our print paper and find something you didn't know you would be interested in until you actually see it and then feel the need to read it. it the Times has done that well. HBR does it well. I think the Globe does it reasonably well. The Journal used to do it every day with their, what do they call it, their A-head. Yeah, uh, yeah. the, the LA Times used to have a special spot on the front page for a story like that. But it's the collection of everything that actually really delights readers. Yeah, that's that's very well said. I mean, just that sense of surprise and delight. Um, and Josh, I love what you're describing in terms of the connectedness and essentialness of of these publications uh, to people's lives um, during the pandemic. Um, I want to ask you and draw uh, a question, which is, uh, and I don't want to get nostalgic, but um, I want you to make a prediction. Um, the Times and the Globe, we're still putting out a print product. How long will that be the case? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, when I started, you know, with the internet, I was really young and brash and basically pretty stupid. So I was like, oh my gosh, like there's no, you're not gonna be any need for print, come on. Um, uh, I Time.com, I have similar stories to what you were saying, you know, about, being there with the print. We, we've reduced print with HBR, but we find it very important. We find people still value it um, and they need it. Um, they want it. And frankly, writers want to be in print still. Um, there, there's still something, and maybe that has to do with the nature of the content that we cover. Um, I don't know that I'd make a, a prediction. I would- um, that, that, that was the requirement that you make a prediction. That was the question. I think that if I were, you know, even running the business I'm running, um, I'm not running headlong to get rid of all print. I might reduce some of it. I might think about it differently, but I think about it strategically. And I think it, I think it does play a role. Does it need to be as frequent? Probably not. In five years time, it's hard to imagine that we need newspapers every single day. Um, or, or they may be in different forms every single, every single day, or, perhaps. Um, it, but I do think it plays a role. I really do. And, and, um, um, and people do, people and writers value it. So I, 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 I'm not sure it disappears in five years. Juan, what do you think? 
Um, I think I agree with Josh. You know, I think, you know, uh, print is here to stay. Uh, um, I mean, I think the physicality of the paper, you know, is something that people like. And there's nothing like, you know, an A1, you know, the way a an, uh, 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 front page of the the paper looks you know uh, there are things you know that you can do in print that you can cannot do in you know online and uh there's you know you know the, i think i remember you know that the, the names of the people who have died you know of covid you know on the front page of the new york times that's something you know that it's impactful and that you can't you can, you can get that experience on the web um and you know, and uh, the couple of uh, uh, digital only um, publications that were around, you know, they they're gone. You know that uh, the Rupert Murdoch experiment, what was it called? Um, uh, it was called the Daily, I think. The, yeah. da the Daily, yes. <laughs> you know that you know ended up not uh, not working out. You know, Quartz is also shaky. You know, so um, I think print is here to stay. And I, I love it. Um, well, I'm feeling very optimistic um, after this. I know, Megan, um, you're eager to uh, let people ask questions. Um, I just want to thank the panel for being so extraordinary. And I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This has been so incredible. Um, and we're so appreciative of everyone being able to share their thoughts and experiences. And we have some fantastic questions coming in in the chat. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'll start off with this first question. Uh, it's a question to the group. News media is a business at the end of the day and needs to generate viewership. More and more people are able to subscribe to something they consider news via professional channels or personal ones, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. To me, that means people simply go to a news channel or publication that is going to publish things consistent with their views. Long way of asking, how much pressure is there within the business side of each of these publications to publish things that you know will agree with your readers' views if that will drive following? Is there anyone who feels strongly about taking that first? I, I can hop in as someone who, you know, has to has to act. <laughs> um, I so I, I don't think the pressure is is in no way direct. And I don't I don't think the pressure is is really there, but I think where it crops up is we're we're journalists we we follow we follow you know our own business we understand sort of the media landscape and and i think that there is a there's a sort of more subtle pull and and I, i'm not saying i'm not speaking just of the times i'm speaking i think across the industry as, as a reporter there's sort of a more subtle pull to recognize you know you see you see what does well you read a lot you know you have a really strong sense of of what kinds of stories are attractive to readers and you have to fight that sometimes. Sometimes you have to embrace it, and sometimes it's educational. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you could, you know, I could easily, I could look around and, and you know, pick the worst possible version of that and try to pursue that, and that wouldn't be professional. It wouldn't be, you know, belong in the times. And so, I don't feel it, at least as a reporter, I don't feel it from the, from our business side. But you know, it's there. I mean, you can't ignore the fact that there are publications out there that get things wrong routinely. And, and just because they frame it well or interestingly, they do well. It might not be totally a, an internet thing. I, when I was at um, Time, I, I, I really had the honor, and it was amazing, of, of doing the archive. So I digitized everything from the past. And to Brian's point, in the 1945, a Time magazine cover with some Italian general you never heard of could sell 400,000 copies because there was nobody buying it. <laughs> you know, they, they don't, I, mean, it was, I mean, I'm not even joking. And then, you know, by, by, by the time you get into the 80s, you got to do stories about how to talk to your dog, right? <laughs> and, then, and then all of a sudden, whoa, whoa, we can get 140,000 copies sold. Like, you were happy with that. And so there was always a pull from the very, you know, there was always this pull of like, you know, wait, we, we, you know, we can't do that dog story every time. Like, it's not new that people realized. I mean, the internet may have exacerbated it. For sure, and I like the way you put it. The subtle pull, I think, is is uh, that's a nice way of phrasing it. And that yeah. that question that was asked, um, and that was by Jason Pinkman. So thank thank you for that. Um, Eric Knight, class of ninety, asked a, a question that sort of follows up on that, which is, how do you think the media has balanced reporting on Trump for eyeballs versus the informative value of the story? 
So sort of still talking about that poll, but even in a different sense of, of following. I mean, I, I guess one thing that was um, uh, clearly a mistake at the beginning of Trump's rise um, uh, was the television networks, uh, the cable network's decision to broadcast his speeches live. And I think there was a, uh, a study out of Harvard that looked at the value of that free airtime and concluded that it was worth about $2 billion in political advertising. And I think um, there was a little bit of an underestimation of, of Trump and a, and a fascination and maybe uh, less moderation. Um, and I think that uh, network executives have kind of uh, wrestled with that and been pretty candid about that um, more recently. Um, you know, I do think that um, Trump is a president uh, who is sort of unprecedented in his understanding of the media and his understanding and sort of uh, occasionally shameless sense of story. Um, I will tell you that when I was the campaign editor in 2016, I had a desk on the third floor. And when I would go out of my office, there were rows of reporters, uh, political reporters. And in the early days of that campaign, I could not walk past those desks without at least one person being on the telephone to Donald Trump. I mean, he just would talk to anybody and he would, uh, you know, you were the lowliest summer intern at the New York Times and he would just try to seduce you, flatter you. Oh, that's so wonderful. You must be, and come up with a nickname for you and try to change your story or overtake your story or be a big part of your story because he had this sort of um, addiction, I think. Um, but he, you know, he was both kind of of the media uh, and, and a media creation. And, um, and I do think that um, there, there was sort of an excess, at least at the beginning. I don't know what the rest of you think, but that's, that's how I saw it. I mean, I, I remember back in the summer of 2015, you know, that Arianna Huffington put out a note to the readers of the Huffington Post saying that they were gonna cover Trump in the entertainment section. Uh, instead of politics, because, you know, they didn't take him seriously. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> and, and to, to Carolyn's point, even as president, as much as he would, um, you know, revile the media and work up his followers to even physically threaten the media, the guy gave more interviews to mainstream media than every president in modern history. I mean, if you compare him to Barack Obama, Obama was virtually unreachable. I mean, he did not, uh, Carolyn, I'd be surprised if he ever sat with the Times in his eight years as president. Mm -hmm. And um, you could get Trump almost whenever you wanted when he was president. And uh, in that way, to your point, he was a product of the media in, in, in many uh, really important ways. I mean, I don't know if I've told you the story, Niraj, but um, there was a moment when um, Trump came in to meet with the editorial board at the New York Times. And um, obviously he wasn't going to, there was not a big chance of him getting the endorsement, but he took the process really seriously and he came in and he answered questions. And at the time we were trying to get him to, um, we were trying to get both candidates, Clinton and uh, Trump to agree to do a virtual reality thing. Uh, I don't know if you know what the, uh, we needed kind of extraordinary access to the campaign. And so I went up there to see him after the editorial board and introduced him to the video team. And he was just gushing and seductive and a salesman. And I described the project. Yes, we're going to do it. He turns to his aides. He tries on the camera. He was just Trump. And then, you know, the next week I went up and Hillary Clinton was there and uh, I did the same pitch, you know, will you be part of this? And she just would not engage. It was just, uh, you know, you must speak to my staff and there was just none of that. Um, so I just think that, that um, there was kind of a, both an addiction and a compulsion, uh, but also understanding that Trump had. Um, also, and, sorry, sorry, Carol. No, go ahead. No, I just, I just have to, the, the times with the daily podcast and as someone who's just been so, I've been, I love digital media from 
but you, I have to just hats off because first of all, podcasts for people don't realize it's a great and, and, and low, low cost way of engaging people in very emotional ways. And the Times does something where Arthur Sulzberger has to go to the White House and basically there they you hear the clip clopping in the hallways he's with two other reporters and it's played out incredibly so yes a Trump was a master in many ways but yeah. the Times also figured something out about how are we covering this how are we giving people another view because really you saw in this podcast that, you know, Trump desperately wanted the hometown paper to give him some good coverage. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. You, and it was so engaging. And as a business person now on the other side, coming from journals, it's not the most expensive way to reach people, but you get them emotionally. So you learned a lot about covering it too. And that, I, I mean, I, I, to Brian's earlier point about strengthening, that um, and maybe the Times is leading the way for, with a lot of resources. Um, that is a huge benefit to what we went through with the, all of that. And that leads. Oh, Carolyn, sorry. Is it all right if I jump in? Please. Yeah. Um, that leads well to this next question um, from Tracy Z, class of '86, um, with the shift to online and the ability to reach worldwide readers. So, talking about this um, accessibility, for example, up here in Montreal, she says, "How do you?" find this affects how your stories are written. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Yep, with the shift to online and the ability to reach worldwide readers. So, you know, accessibility larger than, than print. How do you find this affects your stories are written? How your stories are written? I mean, I think there was a time that, um, look, it's not a secret that our hope, hopes for growth really lie in an international audience. And I think there was a time when we would write national security stories or foreign policy stories, and they were just so clearly and completely seen through an American lens. And I think that, you know, we're trying to open that up and write about right from within Europe or Africa with a sense of uh, that we're not just writing for an American audience, but we're writing for an audience that is global. And it's it's sometimes subtle and sometimes not, but you know, sometimes it's the expressions that you use, the language that you use. Sometimes it's just introducing different voices, but we are really trying to shed the idea that we are writing for essentially a US audience. And, um, and that has been an adjustment for us. I, I, are there places where you're actually trying to specifically write for a local audience? Like, are you opening, are you trying things in Asia or Europe where you're actually gearing it toward that audience specifically and not a US audience? It's really interesting. We tried it. Uh, we tried it in Australia. We tried it in Canada. And it turned out that people, local people were interested in the New York Times covering, but they didn't really want us to do local coverage. They kind of wanted New York Times kind of stories um, about their countries, about the region, but they didn't want us to cover like the back and forth like a local paper would. And it almost felt like we were kind of putting on the wrong clothes or something. It didn't feel like it worked. Um, so now we're making investments in those places, but it's much more for what you would consider traditional enterprise, high level New York Times stories. And we're not trying to remake ourselves for a local audience. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I don't I don't read a lot of international coverage, but I will say that from the sidelines, it seems to me that it's made our coverage, everyone's coverage, much more sensitive um, and improved our coverage. I think when you write about, you know, a political battle in, you know, China, or maybe not China, India, let's say, um, you hear from a lot of people and it's, you know, I mean, there are, there are elites in those countries that may have had access to the Times previously, but, you know, it's there for anyone to read and it's there for, you know, people to use to mobilize against the West or, you know, for whatever political purpose it is. But you can see just, you know, in the way that people are engaged with on social media that it really can strike a chord if you get it wrong or if you, or if you get it right. <laughs> That's an excellent point. That's true. And so sort of for our final question, I'll synthesize a little bit of what we've been talking about in a couple of these questions. There are several uh, folks who are asking about 
this balance between traditional media um, and hometown media and sort of what the future is going to be between um, sort of these large media conglomerates and the survival of local papers? Well, we're seeing um, a god awful trend around the country uh, of big chain newspapers, uh, big chains of newspapers buying local papers in small, medium, even larger cities. And just uh, um, uh, basically just uh, uh, squeezing them dry for money and uh, leaving them a shell of what they used to be. We're seeing it in Denver. Um, uh, we're seeing it in a lot of places, uh, and it's a scary, scary thought. Uh, um, you know, we're, we're fortunate in some places, and Boston is one of them, where we will get, um, um, you know, relatively wealthy people uh, who will buy a news organization and keep it independent, uh, so it's out of the hands of private equity, uh, have the ability to invest in it, and have the confidence to continue to do the news that has to be done in that region. Um, but that is unfortunately more a rarity than the norm right now. But I hope that switches in the coming years. Um, I think a lot of people are realizing it's a lot more glamorous to own a, it's, it might look a lot more glamorous from the outside to own a newspaper than it actually is on the inside. Yeah, it's true. It's, it's true. It, the, the model is really, really difficult. I couldn't agree with you more, Brian. I, I, I'm fortunate enough to spend time on Martha's Vineyard and Oak Bluffs, and the Martha's Vineyard Gazette is an old-time broadsheet, ridiculously large. I love it. I've loved it since I was a kid, and uh, Kohlberg, a, a private equity fellow from uh, who, uh, a KKR, a private equity firm, came in and bought it um, and endowed it. Uh, years ago. It's had a terrible time during COVID, of course, but to your point, like it seemed like the only way to keep the, the, what the paper is and, and, and for people who haven't seen it, it's a, it's a really interesting little local, you know I mean? Yeah. They cover all the land grant and the stuff, but they also have the wackiest, you know, bird column and, you know, and it's, it's amazing and uh, it should not go away. And it's not like a normal business. Um, and it was fortunate to your point, but that is, we can't depend on that. I mean, you're yeah. my dream job, by the way. That's, that's, that's what I think about when I get too stressed in New York. That's, that's. Are you kidding thing. me? They're looking for an editor, Carolyn. <laughs> Actually, wasn't that paper, wasn't the Vineyard paper owned by a New York Times columnist for a long time? Yeah. Rest of editor? Yes. Yeah. Famous, famously. Yeah. yeah. For years. For yeah. years. You heard it here, folks. This is uh, Carolyn's next steps. It's <laughs> breaking news. I <laughs> that you can't afford to live on the vineyard, so I don't think, yeah, I could live in Falmouth. But anyway, it's a great, it, you're right, it's a wonderful treasure of a paper. Yeah. Well, on that lovely um, note, I will uh, start sort of wrapping things up here. I will say there is one more burning question for a couple of our panelists, which there have been several canine appearances this evening, and <laughs> would love to hear about the uh, the, the guest cameos we had, uh, Joan and, and Brian. <laughs> that was intentional. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, I have a, a small dog, and he's... Uh, uh, asking me to go out, so that's why he jumped on the <laughs> he jumped on the on the chair. Uh, mine was Huck, the five year old golden retriever who is forever six months old. Uh, that bed in the background is normally inhabited by a cat named Charlie, who doesn't know that I'm not a cat person. Uh, and <laughs> usually is here all day, every day. Seems to always be the way. This is why um, you write all your books. That's <laughs> right. You get the material. <laughs> Well, thank you all so, so much for joining. Thank you, Carolyn, Naraj, Juan, Josh, Brian. It was so fantastic to have you here. We are lucky to have such an incredible group of um, Bobcats, Bates alumni. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, remember to check out the reunion platform for additional programming coming forward. But I know we're getting great feedback in the chat, thanking you all and um, everyone have just a spectacular evening.